Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have a special guest with us today. Can you tell us who you are? Hi everyone, I'm Gabriel Guillaume. I'm a student at Holy Spirit Seminary, uh, which is located in Banyo. Excellent. Before we go on, we just want to acknowledge the lands on which we meet and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. Gabriel, can you tell us kind of the basics? And I, this is obviously a, a a, a very big question, but can you give us the basics of the Catholic faith for someone who knows nothing about it? Right, okay. Um, well, we as Christians in general, we uh, we know that we're a resurrection people, right? If it wasn't for the resurrection of our Lord, then really our faith would, would be in vain, as, as St. Paul says. Um, so for Catholics, if, if we're speaking um, uh, just for Catholics, um, I think at the center of that, because of where resurrection people, we have uh, the Eucharist. Um, it says in in our catechism uh, that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith, um, because it's at the Eucharist where we come together as a community um, that we celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we come together to receive His body and blood. We hear His word. Um, and it's also taught and we believe that uh, Christ is present um, in both Scripture, in the Eucharist, uh, but also in the people. Uh, it's important that we come together as the people of God to celebrate um, our life of faith. Uh, so that's, I suppose, one of the, the important elements of, of, of the Catholic tradition. Um, I think also if I touch upon where we say that the fullness of truth is is contained. Um, we have scripture, of course, as divine revelation, uh, which is the foundation, as we know, of all Christian belief. Uh, but for our church as well, we have holy tradition um, dating back to St. Peter, um, who Jesus says, you know, is the rock of, of this church, which he which he is um, has established. Um, and from our tradition, we have a line of uh, apostolic successes um, from Peter all the way now to, to Pope Francis that um, lead the church and govern the church in in ways that that it, it may seem um, sort of a bit out of place in today's society um, to have a, a, the central leader or that that hierarchy of um, the the ordained ministers, but. Um, we can see that it was present pretty much pretty early in the church uh, with the leaders of congregations, the, the presbyters, things like that. Um, but besides scripture and tradition, um, there comes the magisterium as well. Um, and that is really what the church has taught us, what, what our bishops and what the Pope um, is teaching the church inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'd say that I guess with those two, um, the Eucharist and these three um, sort of things that we call, that we gain the, the fullness of truth from. Um, it, it governs really the, the Catholic tradition. Excellent. Now you're starting to be a, a Catholic priest. That's right, yeah. Can you tell us what that looks like? What, what are they actually teaching you? Yeah, okay. Um, so as part of our seminary studies, we uh enrolled at ACU the Australian Catholic University um which is uh very well located it's on top of a hill and we live as at the bottom of a hill um so ACU itself used to be the old seminary um back when it was founded in 1941 uh, then called Pius XII Provincial Seminary um and the establishment in which we live in now um so it was, was founded really, um, was, was, was built in, in 2008. Um, so we're very close to ACU. Um, and so we study a Bachelor of Theology and Philosophy. Um, and students go on to complete their Masters in Theology as well. Uh, some topics that that entails, um, or ones that I've covered at least so far, being in my third year of formation, and there's around seven years in total, um, so I've still got <laughs> more than kind of halfway to go. Um, some of the studies that I've done is uh, the the history of our church, 
uh, we began with a, a brief overview, say, of the the, the Jewish people's history um, and worked our way um, upwards to, to where we are now, past the Second Vatican Council in the 60s. Um, we've also looked at um, the biblical prophets um, and that sacred heritage of, of the writings of the prophets in the Bible. Um, we've looked at how to write biblical exegesis, you know, actually reading the Bible, interpreting, and um, sort of looking at not just its history, but how it's how it shaped the beliefs of the Jewish people and how it's still shaping us as Christians today. Um, we've done sacraments class, so how to really learn how we learn about it and then to minister in the sacraments of the church. So that's, you know, baptism, um, marriage, funerals, um, anointing the sick, things like that. Um, and in philosophy, um, which I personally struggle with a little bit, but it's, it's definitely enjoyable as I'm progressing along in my course, um, things like logic, um, ancient Greek philosophy, uh, medieval philosophy, at the moment, we're doing postmodern philosophy, um, and yeah, the, each each semester of the uni year, so we we study four units a semester, um, pretty much the the normal student life. Uh, the only thing that differs is we do some courses in house, which is just taught by seminary formators and lecturers, um, and that's more to do with it, it, it's entail it ta it's tailored more for priests um so for us um such as how to give a homily reflections um things like that now you mentioned um the, the some of the things that you that you've looked at in the history of mm. the catholic church um uh, like the big uh, reform in, in the 1960s with the catholic church with the can you give us a, a bit of information about that for those who don't know about um kind of the big changes that came in <laughs> Right. So, um, so in the in the nineteen sixties, uh, the Second Vatican Council um, was instituted to really um, to bring about a change in the church to that the the Pope, the bishops, uh, the people of God felt was necessary. Um, that the Spirit was guiding the church in this way um, to enact um, a particular change that would not just um, enhance the way that the church would operate, but to really remind us that at the core of who we are, um, we're there to, to preach the gospel uh, and we're there to be missionaries. Um, and I, and I, I believe that was a, a big thing from coming from the Vatican council that our faith is to be shared. Um, you know, that's, that's the, the mandate that Jesus gave us to go to all nations and, um, so it was, it was a big reminder from the Vatican Council that this is uh, what we need to do. Um, and there are a number of liturgical reforms that came from that, say. Um, and an example is the Mass went from being celebrated in Latin to the vernacular. Um, so here we now celebrate our liturgies in English. Um, of course, around the world, that would differ according to the, the languages that they speak. Um, and Scripture also became more of a prominent feature um, following the Vatican Council. It, uh, Catholics were reminded that that scripture is the foundation of, of where we come from, our, of our faith. Um, and it's not something that we just leave for our liturgies. Um, we have to really live the scriptures. The scriptures need to be an essential element in, in our lives. Um, yeah, that's just a very brief probably probably doesn't capture really the the essence of the council but it's it's something no no that was great and you also mentioned learning about the jewish people and of course mm. throughout history unfortunately sometimes you know christians have fueled anti-semitism can mm. you kind of talk a little bit more about kind of learning about the jewish people and sort of their importance to mm. christianity mm. yes of course um Personally, I've always been really attracted to the Jewish heritage. Um, and I, I think that that fuels me in, in, in a particular way to really, uh, well, it's developed a love, say, for, 
for not just their history and heritage, but um, to want to really uh, appreciate them as our brothers in faith. Um, and so we've, uh, not just by looking at the scriptures, but also by returning to the original language in which it was written. Um, so not just reading it as we understand it now and looking at it in the light of the New Testament, but really looking at the scriptures as their story, as the, the their journey as a chosen the chosen people of God. Um, and yeah, honestly, for, for me, at least it's given me a deep gratitude that, that we come from such a rich and prayerful people. Um, and uh, a number of uh, the ways that we celebrate our liturgy uh, in the, in the Catholic tradition has incorporated uh, a number of Jewish elements um, from their faith. Uh, just one example is um in the the Eucharistic prayer um, in the Mass, um, the, the the lines go, you know, uh, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread, da 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 da, and then, then the wine. Um, and as we've learned, that's it, it's come out of a, the, the Jewish uh, tradition of giving thanks to God for uh, food or for um, anything in general. It was just a prayer of thanksgiving to, to bless God. Um, and so to be able to draw on their rich heritage um, and incorporate it into, into our ways of worship, um, I truly think that that is, is quite beneficial. And I look forward to even developing my, my knowledge further as I progress in these years of formation. Excellent. And now you also mentioned philosophy and how it can be a bit of a struggle. Why is it a struggle? To abstract what's the... Strike. yeah um it really requires me to think <laughs> um i think a, a, as part of being in my generation um i sometimes seek the easy way out of things uh, not having to uh, struggle with a concept or um really sit down and, and meditate on ideas that i don't understand um and try to grapple with them um i succumb to just wanting wanting the answer right here right now um and trying to fight that urge i think and really develop my 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 reason uh to actually think like a like a human being uh, that is a great gift that god's given us the ability to think um and learning how to properly exercise that um it's been a, a beautiful struggle i'd say um as i'm growing i would definitely learning more about myself, um, not just about philosophy or theology, but more about how I can be a, a true and um, proper man of God. Is there any philosophies you've come across that you're, you're really liking or any philosophers? Um, I thoroughly enjoyed our unit last semester on ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, that really brought alive this uh, importance of philosophy um in in seminary formation but i think also in general um and in particular we uh we we looked at uh the sto stoicism for our final assessment um mark and marcus's aurelius marcus aurelius's meditations in particular um and that just fascinated me i mean just started at the moment reading the meditations his meditations um just in my personal time because i want to get more of a understanding of this this concept this philosophical concept yeah and how would you describe that concept oh, I'm putting you um, on the spot here but yeah. who don't know what stoicism is what would you yeah. say it is well from from my understanding of reading his meditations uh stoicism has well what interested me at first i'll say that is that um christianity sort of adopted some of these stoic ideas um and these the ideas that i see in in marcus aurelius's meditations at least is a great dependence on the will of god for everything on uh nature and providence um and stoicism um believed that everything really was was god so it was very like pantheistic in its in its approach um so nature was god providence was god all these things were god but i suppose there's a there's an element of truth in that that really struck me of um this 
of what we would call in the Catholic tradition a sacramental uh, a sacramental vision, um, which is seeing everything as a gift from God, not God itself, of course, but as coming from God and given to us to re, uh, to return to God for His glory and for His honor. Um, so that's the that's a little bit of stoicism that kind of struck me, um, and there's still a lot more that I think I, I need to learn about it as well. Yeah. And when it comes to ethics, how mm. do they cover that in your studies? What are you kind of looking yeah. at? So we did an introduction to ethics um, in our second year of formation, um, and it looked at the big topics, uh, the big ethical uh, queries that, that society is facing. And at the moment, actually, we've just begun an introduction to moral theology, um, which is more of a... Uh, particular perspective on some of these same issues, but uh, other moral issues as well, but just in the Catholic tradition. So the intro to ethics was part of our philosophy studies, and it was um, sort of a, a secular outlook on these these issues. Um, but now we're delving into uh, well, where does the Catholic Church stand and where does the Christian tradition actually um, stand with all of these and um, what are the the differences, say, if there are any in particular Christian traditions um, on these topics? So look forward to that one. And you mentioned learning about the history of kind of the church. Were there any kind mm. of uh, events or moments that stood out to you? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I would say the sort of the patristic age right through to... Um, when like monasticism is established um, very early on in the church. Um, so the patristic age details these very um, authoritative church fathers um, who did so much work to explain the faith, to establish doctrine, to um, develop the creed, uh, which which we recite now as our statement of belief, um, so their work was vital in establishing Christianity as different from all the other faiths around the time, from Judaism, from paganism, things like that. Um, and also the the period of monasticism. Um, it's always appealed to me just as one discerning the priesthood and trying to live a little bit of a, a life separated from the world. Um, yeah, that that's always a, an interest of mine to look deeper into that period. So what does day-to-day -day life look like for you when, as you study? So not just looking at the, the study side of it, but the other side of it. Mm. Um, what's daily mm. life? Sure. Um, so we begin the day 7 a.m. with what we call the divine office, uh, which is the prayer of the church. It's the prayer of the people. Um, and it the, the, the office marks the hours of the day. And it's said that it sanctifies the day because we begin the day with morning prayer. We come together at the end of the day with evening prayer and again with night prayer. Um, <clears throat> and that's as a whole community. So that that sets off our day. And from morning prayer, we lead into meditation, uh, 30 minutes of, of that, and then into the celebration of the Mass. So really kicking off the day with um, what's important, giving it to God. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um Studies then go from nine to five, typically, um, depending on your classes or units that you might have. Um, and then what finishes the day is communal dinner in your houses. So we have, I think it's around five, yeah, five houses that we live in. Uh, the one I'm in right now is, is housing seven uh, seminarians, including myself. So we come together for a house dinner. Uh, one person will cook. There's a roster. Um, it's hard to try and learn how to to cook for seven people and to to put the right amount of quant uh, the right quantity of spices and salt. That's a, a struggle of mine. Um, so that's that's how we we tend to finish the day, and then just your personal study or or prayer in in the evening. And what does prayer life look like for you? Because we've had some people who say to us, "I don't know what to pray or, or how to pray." So for you, mm. what's your kind of uh, idea about pr uh, prayer? Mm. It's a great blessing that we have 
um, as I described, the, the liturgy of the hours, because it's completely structured. Um, and it's it's amazing to rely on, in the, especially in those moments of those dry periods where you might not feel like praying or prayer is a struggle or you might have too many things going on in your life and you just you can't focus, you know, you can't come up with with mental prayer. Um, so the office is uh, is very scripturally based. It leads us through the Psalms. We we pray the Psalms. Uh, there's a scripture reading and a reflection afterwards. Um, and it finishes with intercession. So you're praying for the world. You're praying for the people of God. You're praying for uh, the church. Um, so it's it's wonderful that we have that structure that we can rely on. Um, but also in moments of um, quiet reflection, I love to go for walks around nature um, and just give God thanks and, and glory for what I see. Being up at ACU is, is quite beautiful on top of a hill. We can we overlook the city and the airport. So there's a lot to to give thanks to God for. Oh, that's great that you have that mm. environment there. You mentioned meditation. Mm. When people think of meditation, they might think different things like complete silence or saying the mm. same word. What what is meditation for you? Mm. So in the morning, the meditation that we have as a community is silent meditation. Um, so some people might do their own personal spiritual readings. Some might reflect on the the daily um, lectionary, so the the readings for the mass um, to draw more out of it as they participate in the mass. Um, and others like to journal. Um, that's something that I'm trying to get into now is journaling my thoughts and and struggles and uh, and taking that to God in, in prayer. So there's a there's a few different ways that we we spend our time during our meditation. Some others, if they're completely tired, they they might have a little snooze. <laughs> Nothing like a good bit of horizontal meditation. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's right. I had someone tell me they would do meditation. They fell asleep and started snoring, and people have to yeah. say, You're snoring. Yeah. Um, why did you, and this is obviously not, not, uh, an easy answer uh, hmm. or easy question, I should say, uh, why did you become a priest? Why are you wanting to be a priest? Hmm. Uh, yeah, it is a big question. Um, it's something that one who's discerning the priesthood thinks about very often, um, especially when things are getting hard in the seminary studies, are. Uh, you know, too much and you're feeling overwhelmed to be reminded of why you started um, I think is quite important for me I first began thinking about the priesthood when I was seven years old so uh, quite a while now I'm, I'm 22 at the moment um, and that first began just by wanting to be like my parish priest uh, he was a remarkable man I saw him as one who truly cared for his people. He was devoted to his prayers. Um, he celebrated the, the mass yeah, with due reverence. Um, and he was just, just an all around great guy. Um, and I would just think to myself as a kid, yeah, I want to be like, I want to be like him. Um, as I progress a little older, it became more serious, of course. Um, and I recognized in the priesthood, uh, something that would truly bring me fulfillment and peace uh, and joy, um, which I wasn't getting um, by li living a secular life per se. Um, so that's what's what's kept me here, really, that, that I've experienced this joy and peace and fulfillment already. And I'm, I can only imagine that it would, it would be a lot more as the years go on. Well, thanks for sharing uh, that mm -hmm. kind of personal uh, part of your life. For people who have never been to a Catholic church or a service, and of course it's going to you know vary depending on which church you go to and, and, and mm. all that, but can you give us an idea of what a service looks like, what to expect? Someone shows up at the door, they meet you, come on in. Mm. What are they going to see? What are they going to hear? How long is it going to go for? How much kneeling are they going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the the Catholic the Catholic Mass starts and finishes with a hymn so the people of god are joined together in singing uh, singing god's praises and we call that a um an entrance hymn and a, and a processional hymn so coming in and going out um typically the, the final hymn will will relate to 
either mission or, or spreading the gospel or um, carrying forth God's word, what we might have heard in, in the scriptures. Um, so once once a hymn begins, the priest um, the, says a few of the presidential prayers, so he's leading the congregation into this celebration of the Eucharist. Um, and we call this part of the Mass, so there's two parts really that we that the Mass is split in, in, up into. There's the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. In the Liturgy of the Word, which comes first, um, the centre is the Scriptures. So after the priest leads us in some prayers, um, then we give God glory um, through the Gloria, which is the really our most beautiful and, and highest hymn of, of praise and, and worship, um, I would say. Um we then hear from scripture. So there's a first reading, a response or a psalm, second reading on a Sunday at least, um, and then the gospel. So the first reading is typically chosen from the Old Testament. Uh, the second reading um, from either one of the letters of, of, of Paul's or um, really any, any of the other books besides the gospels. Um, for them, the gospel is, of course, for the gospel. Um <laughs> And then from there, the, the priest will sort of explain, he'll give a homily on what the readings are saying, how it pertains to his people, um, and sort of instruct them in, in a way, giving them some advice to live out, how to live out this, this message more so in their lives. Um, and <clears throat> eventually, leading into the, the liturgy of the Eucharist, um, receiving... Um, uh, Jesus' body and blood is the center of that. So there's um, what is the, the the Eucharistic prayers. So the priest is at the altar praying. That's typically when you'd see people kneel. Otherwise, standing is also um, accepted in in some churches. Um, uh, so there's no, there's not too there's not an awful amount of kneeling, uh, but there there is a time and place for it. Um, from the Eucharist. Uh, the people receive uh, Jesus' body and blood, and then there is typically a prayer after communion leading into finishing off the liturgy. Um, it On a Sunday, it typically goes for about an hour. Uh, here in the seminary during the weekdays, when we have it, normally about 30 minutes. And what do priests do on other days? So, you know, friends would always yeah. say to me, okay, so Sunday, what else do they do with the rest of the week? Pretty cushy. Have they told you yet what you'll be doing on Monday to Saturday? <laughs> yeah, well, that's it's funny because that's something I wondered when I was thinking about the priesthood. I would think to myself, it'd be a little bit boring. You're only busy on the Sunday. <laughs> what am I going to do during my week? Um, but what I was told by this, this priest that I was inspired by growing up is um, in a typical day, a priest can experience really all the emotions that it could take someone a lifetime to experience. And he said this because a priest could go in, in, in one day, as an example, from celebrating a wedding, uh, you know, the union of two people, the joys of that and the, the celebration surrounding that. Um, he could go from there to a funeral, um, having to mourn and, and grieve with a family. Um, from there, he could, you know, be with the youth group in the night. And once again, you know, having those moments of high um party like atmosphere um and so his emotions are always going up and down up and down with all these different things that he has to do um and that's at least when i was thinking about the priesthood that really inspired me i wanted to be able to be there at the highs and lows and the the ups and downs of of people's everyday lives um so in some really the priest during the week is meant to be as involved as he can in the, in the lives of his parishioners. And when it comes to members of the public, say friends of yours or just people that you cross paths with, what do you hear from them? Like, what's the common thing? You want to be a priest? Why? Or isn't the church mm. dying? What What mm. are the kind of common things you tend to hear? Yeah, you uh, you, you get a vast array of of responses and and opinions. Um, some people really try to to downplay the decision you've made or they try to redirect you, um, you know, tell you, oh, you'd be better off doing something else. And like you say, you know, oh, there's there's no need for, for priests anymore and you, you, are, you are a dying bunch. Um, 
and there are others who will support you with with all they have. Um, I've been blessed that that's my family. So my family has been very supportive, but some of the other brothers that I study with don't even get that support from their families, which makes it, I would think quite challenging. Um, you know, the closest people in your life, the, the people that you love so much, not being able to support you. Um, so yeah, I've, I've definitely experienced the, the positives and negatives of choosing this, this path. Um, but I think for mainly those who don't understand um, why I would go down this path or priests or seven, you know, men in general going to become priests, um, I think it's just a misunderstanding of what the priesthood is, um, that they don't, um, they don't really see the full picture of the need for priests in this day and age. And um, perhaps they've even lost faith in, in the church and um how she will last into the next age. Um, yeah, I think there, there are a number of reasons that, that people might feel those ways. Absolutely. Thank you mm. so much, Gabriel, for doing this. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Yeah.